and a customer came in and she's looking at our things and all that and looks at this basket that's maybe a third and a half woven and goes, okay, I'll take that. So that was <laughs> wasting my time. And then that Christmas, we put some stuff in Nina Hellman's store when it was on Broad Street for the stroll. And we had a, um, a nest that I think was already owned by somebody, but then three or four other baskets that were available. And what was probably my second mini, and that was the only thing that sold out of this collection of very nice baskets. <laughs> So by then I figured, yeah, I'm not wasting my time to do this, and I would fit them in whenever I could and try to carry them somewhere a little farther. Oh, one of those Ohio girls, too, had come back to the island and had a really, she was, she was maybe a push to my inspiration. Um, she did Ash she baskets, She was the one yeah. who told me, well, it might have been Ash Staves, yeah. but she told me what she did to make extra thin cane. Um, and then the big invention I came up with, I mean, there's no way, with the, the cover wrap that Manny was talking about, this piece right here that covers the rim, when you get a basket, it's like an inch around, there's no way to actually curve a piece of cane to go around that little inch. Um, so I made one out of paper and was real happy. I mean, just a little paper donut, slung it over there, and it's definitely somewhat of a cheat, but it's kind of the only way to do it. So that was my big step forward in the little ones. I think I probably made a couple that had no cover wrap on them, which is okay too. You see some, you know, the occasional antique where the guy never bothered to put a cover wrap on it. So I didn't think it was too far into outer space, so. Yeah. But that's, yeah, collaboration. That's collaboration, yeah. But it was, I mean, both, for, for me, both Alan and Kathleen were invaluable, even if occasionally, uh, you know, you come up with a stumbling block due to your collaboration. <laughs> yeah. So I want, Alan, I want to make one this big. No, not, we don't have the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, right. And no, I never really wanted to do that. But the other thing, the other thing that's really great about being in a, sh a shop with other people is, when you do run into a little problem, you've got somebody to talk to, you've got somebody to help you. And in terms of me, it's like I was never fond of feeding the table saw, but I didn't mind offloading. So. You know, Alan or Knapp would feed and offload, and we could take turns making parts. The same with bending. You've got a big handle or a big set of rims. They take a lot of strength to bend and do the clamps and all that stuff. So having more than one person was really great. And we would set aside, Alan would say, okay, Tuesday we're going to make staves and bend, uh, you know, get the steamer out. And so we would all work together to get parts for, get, you know, line up your molds for the next three or four things or half a dozen things you're going to make and we would work together so and that's really a plus when you're in a shop as opposed to being all by yourself and you know trying to get the rubber band over a big basket when you're trying to get the staves to go down try that all by yourself you know um, smaller ones no problem but a big one it's like you really need somebody else's hands so those things are you know collaborative kind of things plus the ideas you know the ideas I remember a lady came in wanted a butterfly catch, you know, ivory catch. Wanted it to be a butterfly. Well, we'd never done, nobody had done a butterfly. And um, Knapp liked to read the newspaper some days at lunchtime when he was eating his lunch. But by the end of lunch, the napkins that came with his lunch had three different butterfly catches <laughs> sketched on them. <laughs> and then he figured it out. But you know, we could talk and figure figure out how we were gonna do it. And that when I did that purse with a continuous handle, I think we talked about that for three months. <laughs> trying to figure out how to do it. I mean I sort of had the idea here, I knew what I wanted, but to figure out the feet on the thing and how to make the handle work and how to hinge it. I I mean we tried you know, we could use magnets, we could do this, we could do that, you know. And so that, those are kind of collaborations, um, you know, that I remember from being there and um, that work for people that work together. The other big time collaboration is, of course, with the scrim shanders or the ivory carvers. Don't you think now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the basket makers prepare the ivory, do the bending, do the carving of it, polish it, it's all ready to go. And then you take the basket apart and give it to the scrim shander. <laughs> and they do their thing, 
mostly she, because we mostly worked with Leanne Papali, but we worked with, the basket makers work with any scrim shander that the customer wants. And then um, you get it all back and, uh, and assemble, you know, finish your assembly on your basket. So that's a big collaboration with the basket makers here. Or if they want a carving, you know, sometimes, especially with catches and stuff, that stuff has to be done ahead. The basket makers do a lot of the catches, but I know Nancy used to do some once in a while, too. Um, and, you know, if people wanted her to do it, then that's a collaboration because it has to fit the basket that you're making. So those things work hand in hand, I think. Something kind of flashed in my mind, too, in the early days, Alan had bought a couple of really large um, whale jaw bones, and they came from New Bedford. And he said, oh, come on, we, we gotta go pick up those um, jaw bones from the airport. And they are really heavy. I mean, it's, it's two guys can carry one without suffering too much. But, but this was the older airport building where to get any kind of cargo, you had to actually go through the waiting room and talk to a guy behind the desk, and so he does that. So we go walking out of there with this whale jawbone on our shoulder through, there were probably twice, three times as many people in the waiting room waiting for the flight. And everyone go, ooh, ha ha. I mean, we must have been moving, you know, Matt Damon or uh, Leonardo DiCaprio walking through there. That, that was a bit of an ego thing, but that, that's some of the, you know, he would have had a trouble unloading them by himself. So yeah. I think we had to tie them to the roof, too, or to the, well. <laughs> Another collaboration I remember really well was our uh, astronaut basket maker friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dan Birch, who came in the shop. Dan, Dan already knew how to make baskets. I don't know who taught him, do you? He taught himself. Did he? Okay. He walked in there, him and his wife, yeah, he's probably still married to her, and his wife had a shirt on that said JPL on it. Um, it was Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, so I said, oh, um, you work for the JPL, or, um, you know, or you're not an astronaut, are you? And the wife just goes, I'm not gonna be talking to this guy anymore, she goes, <laughs> Literally like that. So that's there's not too many people like this Leonardo DiCaprio thing. He'd walk in, hey Leo, how you doing? I, I got to work, you know. Wish he got something to say. Never mind. An astronaut was like, whoa, the gods have arrived. Um, real nice guy. And, you know, we chatted quite a bit that time. Like I said, his wife. I don't think I had a word to say after that. I think I even tried to concentrate to ask her something about. It. What oh, his there's his, there's his baskets. Nice. Is this? These are Dan's, the astronaut. Ooh. He made those on the International Space Station. Right. Uh, yeah. So I was going to say, he came in the shop. He had made, he knew how to make regular baskets. But he came and asked Knapp, you know, would, would you show me how to do the minis? And he did. You know, so he learned. And then what Dan did was he made all his parts on Earth <laughs> before he went. He could take five pounds of personal stuff with him when he went. So he got a little plastic box and put all his parts in there. And uh, I think I think I remember that he was really worried about the glue because they wouldn't let him have any glue. So if anything that had to be glued, he did that ahead of time before he went. Um, they did let him have a knife so he could shave the cane, but he said he had to do it right next to the vacuum hose, the end of the vacuum hose, so it sucked it up. Um, any dust, you know, so it wouldn't go around in there. But that was a great collaboration. And uh, I actually talked to him this summer. He's going to be here next okay. year. So oh, so maybe. So, But that's a show and tell. He made three, you know, little sets of three, gave these to the Basket Museum. So cool. So. And it gave me a little set of earrings, probably a half inch mold midi basket. Which yeah. I don't that. But that's a, you know, that's. Getting that. old ears pierced, but. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but that's. They hang on a little uh, <laughs> thing you put a photo in, so I got them hanging from that, and then a, uh, one of the stickers he gave me. You know, right, right. One of his missions. But that was one of our fun collaborations, so. You know, really nice. And he's really a super guy, so. And is he still making them? He is still making baskets. I, he made a basket. His sister retired, and he told me he, he. In fact, he sent me pictures. He just he made a scallop bag for his sister for her retirement, and uh, he was real pleased with it. So, but I'll be happy to see him next year. I told him if you're coming next year, we got to get you into the museum, and he said okay. Yeah. You know. So, so that's great. But he's really a super nice guy. But that was a great collaboration too. So. So it sounds like all of your uh, buyers, you know, found you. Really, you didn't have to worry about marketing or, you know, uh, too much. I mean, well, you know, you, you, 
advertised a little bit in the early years, and after that, word of mouth was working just fine. I remember we had a couple of women who came in, and they ordered. They really didn't. They were both blonde. Other than that, they didn't really look alike. But after we made <laughs> two identical nine-inch baskets with bird's eye tops, kind of blonde mm -hmm. top, people say, "Are you guys twins?" <laughs> and I mean, there's no way you'd mistake them for being twins. Um, but they said. They walked in the door and they said, we've been looking for this place for five years. <laughs> and I think it wasn't like getting out the map or ask, or they would ask somebody and they'd say, oh, there, I'll find the chicken box. Well, it took them two years to find out where the chicken box was when they were you know, coming down for four or five days. It wasn't like they were dumb. They just weren't that, they didn't bear down. I mean, they, I think they knew all along they could have jumped into a cab and said, we want to go to the chicken box. And that would have gotten them there. Um, and but we and we had others with kind of the same complaint. And I know being next to the chicken box one <clears throat> one time the band was outside and they were all like Rastas, you know, as a reggae Jamaican band. They were all Jamaicans, dreadlocks down to here, and this older couple walks in. I think this is just a repair or something. Who are those men out there? <laughs> and I go, oh, that's the band. They scared me. <laughs> Were typical of Jamaicans. I mean, the Jamaican sunshine is in their smile. Oh, you know, there wasn't one of them that looked mean. Maybe a little bit like they had a head full of snakes, but other than that, happy, you know, friendly looking people. So, but that was, you know, that was fun. It was great being in the shop. I sort of miss being with the fellows, but I keep thinking Alan will come back one of these days. You never know, you know. Um, Knapp says he will someday, so. But we still see him occasionally. We don't know. Uh, the other thing I'd just like to say before we wrap this up, unless you have questions, is um, teachers are what's important. I've had great ones, <laughs> and I treasure that. Take a basket from everybody that will teach you. You always learn something because everybody does something different. You know, there's more than one way to skin that cat. And everyone does it a little bit different. So how you really learn, and then pretty soon what you do is take a little bit of this one and that one and this one and that one, and then you have your method, if you will. But um, if, you're, if you're interested, take a class from everybody that you can, because that way you really get everybody's methods, you know? And one method might be easier for you than another one. There is a, a synergism there that happens, and I think it really, I mean, Alan and I just pretty much developed, we, we probably saw what other people did, and that was the input from that. I used to be guilty now and then when, when she was around saying, well, I'm taking money from this person to teach them. They already know how to make baskets, and she said, no, the more people that you learn from, the better. So that was always a great justification, and definitely I think she's right. I mean. We would never start off, off people using oak. We'd always say, no, you gotta weave a couple out of cane first. It's a little easier to deal with. Um, um, Carol Linquist would start them off with oak um, if they were competent enough, so. Right. And you know, as you make some, you know, you, you, the other thing that's important to me is try to make the next one better than the one before. I mean, I haven't made a perfect one yet, but boy, I'm aiming for it. <laughs> and. So every time, you know, I screw something up, then the next basket I try to fix that. You know, I try to make each one better. And I think the people that do that are the ones that end up really doing top quality work. The other thing, and I got this tip from Nap, is the details. It's the details that make a difference. You know, and a, a simple detail that some people forget, you know, do you sand your wood? I mean, really sand it so it's really got a nice finish on your wood parts and stuff. That's the difference between an okay basket and a better one. Mm -hmm. And the ones that really spend the time and sand it and then polish it, then, then that's the really good one. So it's those kind of simple things that make a difference in the quality. Because people ask us a lot, what, how do you tell from a good basket from a lousy one, you know? Well, look at it to begin with and um, look for those kind of details, you know? Did they weave the whole basket and didn't bother to pick off any of the hairs from the cane? Is it still on there? It's like, eh, you know? I mean, you might miss one occasionally, but you know, it shouldn't be loaded with them kind of stuff. So it's just those kind of things that make a difference, I think. Um, so it's the details that, that, that matter when you're looking for 
who's better or what not better, but mostly it's kind of personal preference too, I think. You know, I've always told people, go look at everybody's baskets, come to the museum, look at all the baskets, and pick out the ones that you like the best, because the ones that you like the best might not be the ones that I like the best. So it doesn't, you know, there's, it, we get asked all the time, who's the best basket maker? Well, they're all good, you know, and you just might like somebody's style better than other people. We have a game, I know Knapp does this all the time, when we see a basket, we look at it and try to figure out who did it by just the shape, because all the molds are different, mm -hmm. and their handle style is different, and uh, so, you know, it's just a fun thing to do. Say, like, oh, that looks like it might be a, you know, it's a Reyes, or it's a Bill Severins, or it's a whatever. Knapp's better at it than I am, but. Well, sometimes I think that I like the Reyes shapes, but I didn't think he was super quality in terms of woodworking. Yeah. You know, Not really. And I have a Gibbs bag. I think Gibbs did a nicer job on the wood, but I yeah. I liked Reyes's bags, the shapes and everything much. Right. Better. Yeah, I think yeah, some of that might have been by accident. I mean, I, I don't I don't think he made any any of his own molds. Um, oh. Now, every time you say any kind of absolute in this business, you find out later that it wasn't yeah. absolute. Right. Um, <clears throat> but he made the nice tall one with a long slope to it. The first Thai, well, I had a very early Taiwan one, which, you know, a junkie. But this thing from like across Main Street, not even the length, length of Main Street, I, I would have said, oh, that's a ray that's walking by. And I think it was, that's one of the things I thought it was so early because they got done making that, or maybe they made a year's worth of those copy baskets or imports. And so he said, well, no, it'll be much quicker if we don't have to weave them so tall. Um, or here's another you know, basket made by somebody else. Copy this instead. And they ended up just going downhill. But that one I had, I mean, really, the shape was very nice. It was everything that a very graceful Reyes basket is. Mm -hmm. but, and the thing with Reyes baskets, even the best is not the best crafted basket, um, but he did invent the, the top, and he, he gets all the cred for that as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, right. I mean, he's the one that did that. And I mean, the best of his work ma is, is made to look terrible by the best of anybody's work today, mm -hmm. but it's what it is. Mm -hmm. I hate that expression, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, it was it the first. He did it the way he was comfortable doing it. He didn't seem to grow a whole lot. I think he didn't have the time because within a year or two he was popular enough. It's like, I gotta keep making this style. Right, and he turned that into a family business. I don't know if you know that, but his children, <laughs> When, we, when he would have been 100 years old, we had a special exhibit here at the museum, and his family came. And I talked to the son, and they were standing around talking, and I talked to the son, and I said, do you have any of your father's baskets? You know, the one daughter has a lot of them. And uh, the son said, I never wanted any of those things. We hated those baskets. <laughs> and I said, why did you hate the baskets? I was really shocked at that. Why did you hate those? He said, well, dad would set them up during the day, and when we got home from school, we had to weave every night. <laughs> and then the next day, dad would rim them off and set up the next batch. So, you know, he said, we hated those things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a good question to ask him. Yeah, one of his the granddaughter that's still around, I bump into her now and then, she's a lovely person. But I asked her one time, you get, you get a lot of rays. Some of them are very honey tone, you know, dark, but, but the color cane turns when it's old. Some of them come out really brown, almost black looking, almost like they've been painted. Now I have seen some that did get painted, but um, not by him, I don't think. But I asked Jackie um, um, how come some of them are brown like that. She said, yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe, well, one of us kids made the shellac, and you know, you have to heat it up. <laughs> and she said, maybe we burn the shellac. Then. Burn it a little or something. And well, it's probably one out of every 10 that has that dark, oh, wow. everything from dark brown to almost black. <clears throat> and when I got I think it was from, Oh, Sonas maybe, and they just said, this is awful as a color, see what you can do about it. So I think I started spraying it with 409 or something like that, and was working really good at stripping. It might have been paint stripper, I don't know, because it was kind of like 
you either fix it or, or it's, it's trash. thrown away. <laughs> and um, I finally got it so I could, I cleared all. There was no more finish on the top at all. I opened the lid and there's all this goo that had been dripping <laughs> on the inside. So I took that out. I said, it's either wrecked or, so I took it out to the hose we had outside and turned it on full blast. That blew out all the goo. And then I think I had to stain it before it looked any good. And it really, it came out okay. Um, it did look like it had been uh, violently handled, which was true. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? Before we wrap up. Where did Alan learn to make baskets? He, his, when I moved here, it was his girlfriend, who was Laurel Plank from Lexington, Mass, and they suffered in Duxbury. And when we were like, my brother and I were like 12, we swam against them in the Cohasset swim team. And I never saw her in Duxbury at Eel River Yacht Club. Never saw her again and didn't recognize her obviously when I got here, but that's who it was, was Laurel Plank. Um, um, she signed up for less, lessons that were taught by Paul Johnson with the Artist Association. And she couldn't go for some reason and said, you know, you go down and-, and Get my stuff. Do you, do you want to take, oh, was it? Yeah, just get my stuff. Get the stuff. Well he, well, he went down there and said, it's nothing but a room full of women, you know, <laughs> like the three students, yeah, let me out of here. So he grabbed the stuff from Paul. Now, Paul's a great guy and very uh, informative. Anyway, Paul probably gave him some, you know, advice in there or maybe they... Well, I think he got together Paul. again with Paul after that. When my first plate, when I said, yeah, you might as well show me how to make this, this, one of these things, he said, all right, let's go over and get uh, plates from uh, Paul because we weren't set up to make the plates ourselves. So. And Paul, I think he used a garage. He's on Copper Street. Was in a little building, about from the wall to here oh, and there. And he had like a drill press, uh, a door, and nice windows in it for such a small space. But and they had a bigger. We went over later the first time we cut oak and worked out of the garage. And that was. I don't know why it's always stuck in my mind about Paul, but when you you want to when you cut the staves, they're all green oak, meaning quite moist from the, from the tree, really. So he put them in a bag and put them in the freezer. And he's putting them in these trash bags, Paul, and I, I maybe I was doing it too, and I said, this is a really thick bag. What, what, what kind of bag is that? And he goes, you like that? They call these Bagzilla. Now, they don't make them anymore, but the enthusiasm in his voice, I'm like, ah, somebody else who shares the finer points of trash bags. <laughs> <clears throat> That's probably more my own weirdness, although maybe, maybe a collaboration of weirdness, because he's so quite impressed with the bagzilla. <laughs> with the bagzilla. And then I don't think I think I think I looked for him at the supermarket after that, and they didn't make them. They stopped. I don't know. Stop doing them. They're too expensive for people. Any other questions, anybody? Before we is, give is it up. That big, um that you sit that with the handle all around the one that Etsco is holding in the magazine. It, it no, she's that's a knockoff, if you will. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the, that she had made it. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. She does great basket. You know those girls. I think the Japanese thing for basket Nantucket baskets started with Noriko. Um, when I was first in this shop behind a chicken box when we were still over there. Um, I think either Knapp or Alan t said, uh, Noriko's coming. And I said, okay. And so off of the boat came a big limousine with her driver and her interpreters. And she came into the shop to get, buy baskets. She came several years well, while I was her second. Was it a second trip? Being, yeah. Somebody, well, first her assistant called once and said, can you make an appointment? Uh, can we make an appointment with you? Ah! From, from New York. Um, then her assistant called again, and then it was probably four or five days before she was due. It was set up an appointment, and I remember it was for 11 o'clock on a Sunday. That's why the appointment was kind of critical. Um, I wasn't usually in there on Sunday. But then a guy goes, this is so-and-so from executive transportation. Uh, I just want to make sure I have the address right. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> so then, 10.30 in the morning, I'm up on Sunday. I'm getting dressed and getting ready, saying, oh, okay, I'll leave in 15 minutes, and I'll be there in plenty of time. I live very close to, the, to Dave Street. Um, but Alan's dad, Seaweed, calls, and he could tend to Seaweed. mumble or sputter or the typical things you'd expect from a 
a sea captain. Um, <laughs> hey, my friends, there's people out there that are, that are taking pictures. She's wearing a fur coat. Um, they got a limousine. So I said, all right, tell them we'll be there in five minutes. I jump on the bike and I'm there in five minutes. They were early for their appointment. But, um, right. and they were, she had a fur coat on and the gentleman, I think it might've been the guy she ended up marrying years later, but he's click, 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 taking, she, you know, posing, click, click in front of the door. Um, and I think I had three pretty unusual baskets in the case uh, that I had made and they all left with her. Right. And they were back in years later, but yeah. this, this time I remember being all by myself. Um, but she was the first Japanese and I think she put those in a magazine. Right, I was gonna say, she. I think she was a fashion, model or owned fashion stores or something because yeah. they ended up sending us magazines back with the Nantucket baskets on her yeah. arm you know in the photographs I really think that's the beginning well, and actually after her maybe six months four Japanese women came in one of them spoke and they had never seen Japanese people on the island back then I, we didn't have Bulgarians then. <laughs> uh, there might have been Jamaicans and Irish. You know, this is the very Indians. beginning of our <laughs> wonderful uh, expansion of uh, But um, I, she bought the first, um, I did like a, a full carved scallop shell. And so the wings of the scallop kind of overlaid the weaving. It had to be woven upside down and backwards, um, like the basket, not me. Uh -huh. Although it might have been. Uh, but she bought that one, and that one just cropped up on Instagram. That yeah. There's people, and you know, so this was years ago. And that's one of the ones I, I actually, I was on the plane on the way back, and they landed, maybe it was landing in Newark, and I asked Esco, what's new in this basket? Uh, you know, I did that one years ago. She goes, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, do you need royalties? Do you want credit or whatever? And I said, no, I just, just credit, just credit, you know, yeah. Um, and it might have taken them that long to copy it out of that old material. And at some point, it was probably years ago, I just said, it doesn't matter. Even, even to Esco, I was saying, I, I don't know what I want. I don't want money. I don't really care about the credit, but I just wonder what road it took to get, you know, from my hands into everybody's hands. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Noriko had, well, oh, these four that walked in the shop, I said, oh, maybe you guys, do you need, I didn't even know she did clothing, um, but I said, this woman, I think she has a story, she was in just like six months ago, does anybody know this woman? And one of the women of the four goes, and she's just gesturing, everything I'm wearing came from her store, yeah. so <laughs> didn't, didn't need any English to understand it. But I think her coming... I don't know how she ever found out about mm -hmm. light ship baskets. I really don't. I don't think any of us do. But that coming, that was a long time ago. What year was that? Well, it had to be at least 20 years ago. Hmm. Yeah. But then we saw her in the magazines, you know, with, with the baskets. And, you know, they're getting to be pretty popular now over there, which is wonderful, you which know, expansion. You know, it's really great. Well, yeah, really, I mean, they all did. So lousiest one, you know, the first, the most ranked beginner who makes a basket there, they come out great. I mean, Beautiful, yeah. Yeah. And Any other? Really concentrate on it, really, really yeah. make something special. Any other questions, anybody? No? Who, who gives lessons these days on an uh, island? Uh, Tim and Carol. Mm -hmm. Still. That I know of, yeah. I don't know if Nap will once in a while or not, but. Maybe next year. Those two are the ones. I should just if, if you were quarter-inch plywood that I, I was put on the ceiling in my garage. Want me to bring my yeah. broom? Yeah. <laughs> if um, that place needs more than a broom right now. <laughs> As I was thinking about what I was going, what we were going to talk about today, I thought we don't have anything to talk about, but we do have a lot of stuff to talk about. Mm -hmm. But um, if you were willing to sit here for all this time. Then I did bring, oh, I'm going to call it a surprise, but something that you can look at that's definitely a collaboration, okay? Um, I learned the skills from NAP, and the collaboration also came with Leanne. So we'll just have a little treat, and uh, you can come up afterwards and take a look. Oh, wow. Um, if you like, I think I'll wow. spread them over here. But the, these are a collaboration between you, the scrim shander, and the owner, and of course, whoever taught you. But I'll put these up over here if you'd like to look at them afterwards. But 
<laughs> They're great fun. Thank you very much. Yeah. Some of you have seen them. Thank you very much to Kathleen and Matt. And please enjoy the show and tell. Uh, the other thing I want to say, and I always do it whenever I give a talk at the museum, if you're not a member, you need to be. So please get a membership form, sign up, you know, keep get, get you on our news list and support the museum. It's important, you know. Okay.